everyone. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for joining us. Today, I am joined by Dr. David Turetsky, professor at Carnegie Mellon University, a good friend, a good mentor to me, whom I've whom I know, uh, known for a number of years. And today, we'll be talking about the newly designed lesson plan by Dr. Turetsky about exploring the strengths, weaknesses, ethics of chat GPT in classrooms, which is designed for grades three through six or third through sixth grade. Uh, Dr. Tereski, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure to be with you, Ruz. So first, before we talk about the lesson plan, what is chat GPT and why should we care? Chat GPT is the latest of a long line of large language models that have been developed by all the major AI players, Google, OpenAI, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Baidu in China. All of them are building these large language models. And what they are is the first, they're the first really large neural network that seems to have a general reasoning capacity, which was unexpected because these, these models are trained by just exposing them to massive amounts of text and asking them to predict missing words in the text. So simpler models that do the same thing, just learn a statistical model of language and they're limited in their ability to predict, but something happens when you scale up. And so this was only discovered a couple of years ago now that when you scale up large enough, there's some kind of change that happens to the system. And all of a sudden it's able to exhibit some, some kind of reasoning. It's, it's not quite human reasoning, uh, but it's, it's a kind of reasoning. And so they become capable of doing many, many interesting tasks. And, and because they were trained on this gigantic corpus of text, think all of Wikipedia, um, large chunks of the existing web, um, huge amounts of newspaper articles, hundreds of books, uh, because they're trained on such a large corpus of text, they actually know quite a lot. So they have, if you combine encyclopedic knowledge with a, a reasoning ability and the ability to follow instructions, you get something that's quite unique. And uh, OpenAI was the first company to make this public. Um, the other companies, Google especially, um, have been building models like this but they were afraid to let the public get their hands on it, um, in part because of reputational risk. If, if a Google AI system does something outrageous, that that doesn't look good for Google. But, but OpenAI is not a publicly traded company. They have a lot less to lose and a lot more to gain. So if their AI system does something outrageous, they get tons of free publicity for it. And so, so OpenAI basically ate Google's lunch and went public with ChatGPT back in November and uh, the whole world has been going nuts over it because people can do their own experiments. They can play with it themselves and find new ways to use it, ways that perhaps the developers never even considered. That's amazing. Also, um, let's come back to K-12 education. You are a co-founder and also a chair at AI for K-12, something that you've been doing for a number of years. You have been giving speeches about uh, uh, chat GPT, other applications of AI to both educators and also to the broader K-12 community. Um, what is your message to them? Because there's also a lot of fear or a lot of ambiguity, maybe uncertainty in terms of use of chat GPT in classrooms, outside of classrooms, by students. So it, that's one way to think uh, about it. But in developing what you develop, which is a lesson plan, looking at the strengths of it, weaknesses, and ethical concerns, you had a quite a different approach so what is your uh, message to educators that are watching us or perhaps sometimes maybe I would argue anxious about these new developments? Well, I, I think we're living in historic times. We're, we're going to look back at, at 2023 and say that was a year that things things really changed. And it's very hard when you're, when you're in the middle of history um, to know how things are going to turn out or to recognize what will ultimately prove significant. So we're just now trying to figure out what all the implications are of this new technology. People are very worried about students using ChatGPT to write their essays, but I think in the long run, we'll, we'll adapt to that. We'll, we'll find ways to cope with that. Um, what's more interesting is all the ways people can use ChatGPT to 
gain inspiration, um, to um, workshop ideas, to to try to to look for suggestions that they could then use their own intelligence to explore more deeply. Um, something that really excited me was the ability to use ChatGPT for for tutoring. So. Um, I, I asked it to quiz me on the state capitals of Nigeria, and and it did. Um, I got everyone wrong. I've never been to Nigeria, but the the fact that you could ask for help for tutoring for mentoring on any topic, and it, it's instantly available and able to do that, to me that's that's much more significant as an educator uh, than the worry about kids getting help writing their essays. So thinking about all the ways that we can use this to amplify our own learning, to support our students who maybe need drilling in some areas um, or um, need, need help mastering a concept they need to explain several different ways. You, you, can, you can spend a lot of money on professional tutors if you, if you have that kind of resources. But if you don't, ChatGPT is the first example of technology that, that could help everyone because at the moment it's free to use. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, we've been using it. I think a lot of people have been, have been uh, having fun with it, but now you're bringing the fun into the classroom. And there's a link folks at the bottom of this video link. Uh, you can access the lesson plan. It's free to all of you. So feel free to download it. There's a link over here. There's also a link to AI for K-12, which you can see all the resources that are, that are available and, uh, from the community, AI community. Uh, and also Dr. Turetsky, but let's jump into this lesson plan uh, and, and tell us a little bit about the lesson plan. Could you un, 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 unpack it for us, uh, the way you designed it, the components of it, and why each component are there and uh, the, the significance of them? And, and uh, what do you hope that students take away from it or teachers take away from it by bringing it to their classrooms? So I, I created this lesson plan in collaboration with Erica Wilson. And what we wanted to do was give students a little taste of some of the things that ChatGPT can do. Um, so for example, we have it um, tell the story of Goldilocks and the three bears, and then look at variations. So tell it from the mama bear's point of view, for example. Um, so and we don't explore all the things that ChatGPT can do um, because it can do many, many tasks that might be beyond the, uh, the level of a third to sixth grader. So for example, it can write code. Um, we didn't explore that. It can translate uh, into other languages. We didn't explore that. But the kinds of things we did explore involved generating text and then changing the text in some in some way. Um, could you tell the story in uh, in a Shakespearean style, for example? Um, so that was the first thing was just showing the, the versatility of in text generation and the ability of ChatGPT to follow these instructions because we're just asking it in conversational English telling it what to do, um, and it's following those instructions. So there's a lot of intelligence involved in understanding what the query was, what the request was, and then in figuring out how do you go about satisfying that request. So that's that's where the intelligence comes in that's surprising everyone, that this neural network can actually not only understand these requests, but figure out a way to satisfy them. But there are also important limits to what ChatGPT can do, and so uh, another part of the lesson plan involves exploring things that it, it might get wrong. Um, and people are the people have been very concerned about the use of these large language models uh, to do negative things, for example, um, to generate negative text about people. And so uh, OpenAI has tried to build in safeguards uh, to prevent it from doing that. but but there there are ways around these safeguards. So it's an ongoing, arms race between the people who want to make it do naughty things and the people who are trying to prevent that. So we do in the lesson plan, we we ask students to try and get chat GPT to say something um, negative about someone and watch that it declines to do so. It, um, these kinds of safeguards, they're an example of ethical AI where you think about how your AI artifact might be used, what are the negative possible effects as well as the positive ones? And then what steps can you take to prevent the negative uses of your technology? And you know, what I found very amazing, uh, Dr. Tresky, is you decided to build this lesson plan for the grade man's third through sixth grade, which is much younger kids. And 
I've seen that you've also done this, uh, um, uh, particularly when it comes to other AI applications as well, which is very, very difficult. Why such focus? Why focus on much younger kids? Uh, where is that coming from? Well, eventually we'll have lesson plans for all the grade levels, but I think doing this for the younger kids is is the most interesting because they're they're just learning, they're just becoming uh, adept language users themselves, and so uh, if and they're the ones growing up with these AI um, entities uh, that are using language better than they do, right? If you're if you're in third or fourth grade, you don't write as well as ChatGPT does yet. And so uh, it's really important, I think, to get these kids at the young age, they're going to be encountering ChatGPT sooner rather than later, and helping them to understand it and showing them how to think about it um, has the greatest potential impact for their future education. I want to talk about a bit about uh, AI thinking, a concept that you introduced, you talked about in a chapter of a book that's published, folks, by the way, the copy of a uh, link to the chapter uh, uh, which is uh, uh, which has been published on computational thinking, but uh, the chapter Dr. Tereski and Dr. Christina uh, Ligu Gartner had uh, written, if I believe, is about AI thinking. It should be uh, the link is at the bottom of this video. We'll talk about that a bit, but I think you have two really awesome slides that you're going to be sharing with us, which is part of a larger presentation. Which hopefully we can find a link in the coming weeks, as of the recording of this video, or months on AI for K-12. First of all, is that accurate? Should we find some sort of a link to your presentation on ChatGPT in the coming weeks or months? Yes, I'll, I'll publish the slides at AI for K-12. And uh, the first time I gave this talk was at an event at Fairleigh Dickinson University last week. And I know they video recorded it. So um, I'll see if they're uh, gonna make the video publicly available. We can link to that. And, and you were graciously agreeing to share uh, two slides with us, which comes out of that conversation or that presentation that you've done. So uh, the, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to bore everyone with a long lecture, but I figured two slides is probably enough uh, to, to convey something useful. So um, what I'm trying to cover with these two slides is the question of how does ChatGPT understand what we're telling it? Um, and the short answer is we don't know yet. There's a lot of stuff going on there that uh, machine learning experts are, are trying to unpack, but we have a we have a, an approximate idea, and that's what I'm trying to get across here. So um, let's look at the question of how does the computer understand a sentence like the cat chased the mouse to its nest. So the first thing you need to know is that these large language models, including ChatGPT. They use something called embeddings to represent the meaning of individual words. So an embedding is a, uh, a vector of numbers. Um, might be, say, 300 numbers. It might be, some of these use uh, 768 uh, numbers. So just imagine that each one of these words at the bottom of the slide is actually 768 numbers that in some way encode the meaning of the word. So if you look at the word cat here, well, Cat has a lot of a lot of possible meanings. We could be referring to a house cat. We could be referring to what people call big cats, tigers, and lions. Uh, we could be referring to cat as a species. Um, if you collect stuffed animals, you might have a plush cat, so not a living cat at all. Um, we there are cartoon cats, um, and you might even call somebody a cool cat. So in the embedding for cat, all of these meanings are mushed together. Um, to give this broad uh, but somewhat fuzzy notion of what cat means. And the same is true for all the other words in the sentence. So mouse, for example, could be a rodent or it could be a computer mouse. Um, mouse is also a verb. You can mouse on things, so it's not just a noun. So all those possible meanings are, are glommed together into this 768 element vector that's the embedding for the word mouse. So in order for these large language models to understand the meaning of what we're telling them, they have to disambiguate these words by looking at the context. And to do that, they use this thing called an attention head. This was invented by some uh, machine learning researchers at Google. So Google had the first large language model that used attention heads. And OpenAI uses this attention head technology in their GPT models, including the latest one, ChatGPT. So let's look at just this first attention head here. 
which is concerned with the word cat. So there's one of these for every word in the sentence. And it's concerned with the word cat. And what it's doing is it's looking at all the other words in the sentence and asking how these other words can contribute to its understanding of the word cat. So for example, it sees that the word cat is followed by the word chaste. And a little bit further in the sentence is the word mouse. And so it decides that the, the proper encoding for cat is as a house cat. It's something that's alive and something that's chasing something. So we took this very generic representation of cat at level zero here, and we built a more contextually aware representation of cat that says this particular cat at this location in the sentence is a living house cat that's chasing something. And we can do the same thing for mouse. Um, this particular instance of mouse is actually a rodent, not a computer mouse. It's alive and it's being chased. And so um, attention head one, we can say, well, attention head one seems to be concerned with the, the senses of a word, figuring out which sense of a word applies in the given context. But there's more than one attention head. So attention head two over here, um, it's looking at the word it's. And maybe attention head two's job is to resolve reference. So when you have a, a pronoun like his or its, we have to know what does it refer to? Um, and in this case, it's is going to refer back to some preceding noun in the sentence. But there are two preceding nouns, cat and mouse. And so it's uses the context and it uses its knowledge about cat and mice to figure out that it's, in this case, is referring to the mouse and not the cat. And in fact, it's referring to a mouse that possesses a nest. So attention head one doesn't help us very much with the word it's but attention head two does just the right thing. And there are more than two attention heads. So attention head three might be concerned with rhyming, for example, because chat GPT can compose poetry. So it needs to know what words rhyme with other words. Attention head four might be concerned with numbers and so on. So we started out at level zero with this very generic embedding of words. And up at level one, now we have this context sensitive embedding of words where we've elaborated their representation based on the context. Now, if there were just these two levels and nothing else, we wouldn't get very far. So here's, here's what's gonna blow your mind. If you look in GPT-3, which was the, the model that came before GPT-3.5, which is what's in chat GPT, you'll see that there aren't just one layer of uh, attention heads, there are 96 layers of attention heads. So everything we looked at at the previous slide was just layer one, taking the embedding level zero and mapping it to embedding level one. We're gonna do that 95 more times. And then each one of these layers has not just one or two attention heads, it's got 16 of them. And each of these things is a neural network with thousands of weights. And so this entire architecture here has 175 billion weights in it. And that's what makes this thing so powerful. It's what enables it to do what looks like reasoning. So this large language models of which the GPT family are just one example, this is a significant milestone in AI. It's like, it's like discovering radio, right? So when, when Marconi was able to make the first radio transmission, people realize that, well, you know, this, this might be trouble for the telegraph companies, right? But nobody thought about streaming videos from your phone, right? That was just too far in the future to even imagine, right? And so this is what's happening right now. This is like the discovery of, discovery of radio, people trying to figure out what is this going to mean for us? What is this going to enable that we couldn't do before? Um, Transformers can do reasoning. So these, these models are called transformer models, these things that have the attention heads inside them. They can do reasoning, but it's not yet human-like. And it's it's possible to push chat GPT um, in directions it's not designed to go, and you'll see it break, its reasoning will break down. It's not the same as human reasoning. We're just beginning to figure out what these attention heads do. The story I told about attention heads one and two is sort of our intuition based on on examining what these neural networks are doing. But you have to remember, these attention heads were not designed by human beings. They were created by a machine learning algorithm, which 
doesn't care if the things it creates are easily explainable to human beings. So we make out these little stories about what the attention heads are doing, but what they're really doing might be more complex than we can even describe. So these models are being deployed in products today. Microsoft has been in, uh, um, introducing uh, ChatGPT into Bing search. Uh, Google has been integrating uh, their model is called BARD um, into Google search. Google is not yet released their thing. Like even, even Microsoft is only releasing uh, the Bing chat GPT combination to some friendly uh, beta testers. It's not public yet, but it, it will be soon. And there are many other products coming along that are gonna have chat GPT modules inside. So things like Microsoft Word, for example, might well include a writing assistant uh, that will help you uh, write text um, using chat GPT behind the scenes. So we're going to see lots of applications of this um, in the in the coming months and years. And it means that the nature of work will change as well. So the kinds of jobs people will get and the kinds of skills they need will change as this technology becomes more prevalent. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, first of all, these three slides that you, you've showed us really, really helped me personally to understand this a little bit better. Uh, and I'm sure it will be the case for our educators that are watching us. Um, but let me shift away, Dr. Turetsky, because you've been always excited about AI, AI education, particularly for our youth. And I want to uh, wrap up our conversation with the bigger conversation that you you brought the community or you 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 brought up to the community AI educator community and AI educator community about AI thinking so what is what would you like the takeaway to be for our students for our educators as we are putting this big bigger wrap AI thinking around this so AI thinking suddenly became much more important uh, with the appearance of ChatGPT because it, it means that some of these impacts of AI that were forecasted for the medium term future have suddenly become much more imminent. Um, some of them are happening right now. So the term AI thinking is a play on the computational thinking idea. So computational thinking was a, a concept introduced by Jeanette Wing. And it, it was it was about getting people to think in terms of uh, in terms of computer science concepts, like how do you represent information? How do you process information? It's a kind of a systematic approach to problem solving, to information processing. So even if you don't want to be a programmer, computational thinking can still be valuable to you because it, it helps you think about how you can apply technology to whatever it is you do want to do. If you're a farmer or a physician, um, these technologies can, they are going to, to affect the practice of, of whatever your craft is. And so learning to think about things like, like algorithms and representations and systematic approaches to problem solving, uh, breaking problems down, it's called decomposition, um, extracting away the unnecessary details, what's called abstraction. These are all key ideas in computational thinking. And so AI thinking comes along and says, well, yeah, computational thinking is certainly important, but but now we've got these AI technologies. And so we need to think about AI thinking, which means thinking about how computers reason, about what computers can know. So how do you get knowledge into a computer? And then how do you use computers that have perceptual abilities comparable to humans, that have reasoning abilities comparable, or in some cases, uh, better than humans? How do you make use of that? How do you accommodate that in your work? Um, and that's, you know, that's that's a novel approach, I think, uh, to AI because it's no longer this this obscure specialty you study in grad school. Now the kids are growing up with this, and so it's it's thinking about the technology that's permeating your your daily life. Our, our phones are full of different kinds of AI technology, so we're living with it. We're depending on it, and now we need to understand it. Amazing, simply amazing. Folks, there's a link at the bottom of this video that you can watch Dr. Turetsky's talk to a group of uh, 
computer science teachers about this concept of AI thinking. And I think in the beginning of the conversation, if I recall that correctly from that inter uh, that presentation, you said you're trying to make the case about AI thinking. I think not only you've made the case in your presentation, you also made the case today about AI thinking. Uh, and I look forward, I look forward to also see other lesson plans about chat GPT and other things as we are trying to promote that that way of thinking in our K-12 community. Dr. Turetsky, as is customary in my interviews, you always have the last, for, uh, last word to our audience, for our audience, with our audience, educators, parents, students that are watching us. Here's you and our audience. I would just say, enjoy the fact that you're living in history making times. Uh, make your students or your children aware of that, just sort of revel in it a little bit, right? The, the, news, is, the news stories are full of um, chat GPT. Every day there's another chat GPT story. We're living in history making times. It's, it's really exciting. Don't worry so much about it. Take some pleasure in it, play with it yourself and we'll all see what happens. On that note, yeah, you're watching my interview with Dr. David Tresky of Carnegie Mellon University and AI for K-12, everything, everything we talked about and more. There's a link at the bottom of this uh, video, so you can download it. You can also reach uh, reach out to Dr. Turetsky, link to AI for K-12, link to all the presentations and 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 also to the talks and clips. So check it out. And uh, looking forward to see you soon, Dr. Turetsky, uh, to have another interesting conversation about another interesting topic in AI. Thanks for joining us, everyone. My pleasure. Thank you.